and attend the fourth child. Okay, I've proposed the idea that perhaps William and his wife, or baby mama, but most likely for this scenario, wife, would have had four kids instead of the three that we see in game. This was actually mostly based off The Immortal and the Restless, the TV series from Sister Location, where a woman is telling a character most assumed was meant to represent William that he had a son that was clearly his, but he was denying it. And after looking at genetics and then trying to explain it to people in my life who didn't really understand, it just goes to show how likely the actual scenario is. If the babies came out blonde like Elizabeth, William might just have thought that they weren't his. So what if later William realized that the baby was his and wanted her back? Or perhaps I'm wrong about the whole he denied it thing. And it was just a theory, uh, <laughs> until a comment from YouTube user Saber Sapphire on the Tiny Details Part 7 video from ages ago. I think we can all agree that Clara is an allegory for Mrs. Afton, and that William made Ballora as a way to cope with her loss. We can also agree that she's a mother figure to the mini Renas, and that's what got us all thinking that she was meant to be the mother in the first place, aside from her song at least. Well, Saber pointed out that the number of mini Renas that Ballora has is four. Ballora has four children, and if she is meant to represent the mother of the Afton kids, this detail could solidify this theory even more. And maybe, just maybe, that's where Vanessa came from. In at nine, false conviction. On an old timeline video, Shauna S commented, quote, quick little theory. You know how in the first game it says the killer was convicted for the murders? If that's the case, I think Henry was falsely convicted. But since they couldn't find the body, he got 25 to 30 years and got out of prison when Fast Bear Frights happened. It explains to me why he wasn't involved in the first few games. I will say I've heard a lot of different information concerning the missing children's incident, so my theory could be wrong, just wanted to put it out there. Honestly, uh, Henry being falsely imprisoned, or at least falsely accused, for the missing children's incident does explain a lot. Considering how there were no bodies though, there wouldn't be much forensic evidence. So the case would rely on circumstantial evidence to get a conviction. So the case could have dragged on for a while if it even went to trial. And if it was, it probably would have been going on until 1993 when the future Fazbear Frights location closed with William inside. 30 years is a lot of time for new evidence to come to light as well, and maybe Henry got out even earlier than that but didn't act until William was freed because he didn't really see a point. Well, the whole he was convicted thing could be explained away by Scott not thinking that there would be another game, let alone like nine others. Maybe he just wanted to have the story of the killer end as well. Mm. Who knows? And it ate the bite of 87. The survival logbook makes yet another unscheduled appearance in my life, uh, but this time either solidifying or making the bite of 87 even more confusing. The bite of 87 being the mysterious incident where someone, presumably Jeremy from FNAF 2, gets his frontal lobe bitten off by an animatronic. We thought that we had the animatronic pinned as Mangle, but then Ultimate Custom Night comes along and proposed that maybe it was Toy Chica. Using the line, where's my beak, lodged in your forehead of course. I mean, what else could that freaking mean, right? However, I think the logbook can actually give us more of an answer as to who done did it. As if we could forget about the incident. That damn thing is ingrained in our brains so bad that we think the bite of 83 is the bite of 87, but it's not. Since, on page 87, we see a couple animatronic cage matches, with you determining the winner and then explaining why. On page 86, this is also the case, with both pages having debates between animatronics. However, Mangle is the only one that appears on page 87, and is clear set up to win being pitted against Balloon Boy. Chica is also present within these kind of cage matches, but she's on page 86 against Freddy, which is a much more fair matchup, okay? Maybe, like, is this Scott correcting us from what we thought in Ultimate Custom Night? I don't know, maybe. Tell me what you think in the comments. And it's Seven Spring Traps Revenge. Yet another questionable business decision from Fazbear Entertainment. Spring Traps Revenge is a VR game that is the subject of the Fazbear Fright story in the the Flesh from Bunny Call, the fifth book in the series. The story revolves around a game theorist, sorry, I mean a, a developer named Matt, who creates a spring trap AI using all of his anger from a divorce and multiple failed relationships. Hashtag relatable. However, the game is too difficult, so instead Matt reprograms the game to torture spring trap because he gets mad at the character he created. My question is though, why would they make a whole VR game around surviving spring trap when he was a real life serial killer? in their reality. I don't get it. Like, sure, in our world, we wouldn't care, because uh, he's not real, but it's not like Valve or Stress Level Zero is making a Ted Bundy or, like, John Wayne Gacy survival game, okay? Because that would be in poor taste. 
and way too real for anyone related to the victims of those killers. So, why would Fazbear Entertainment willingly make a video game revolving around the killer that ruined their reputation in the first place, not to mention was their CE O? It seems like a horrible idea. Um, and it has greater implications for just how the series is in general. I, it's stupid. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Who would buy that? Probably everyone. And it's six mediocre melodies. Okay, now this isn't entirely new news or news at all at this point, but we learned the origins of the mediocre melodies crew. All right, what seemed like random additions in FNAF 6 were actually set up three games earlier. FNAF 3's Night 4 Phone Calls has Phone Guy talking about multiple and simultaneous spring lock failures occurring at a sister location. This isn't the place that we visit in that game, but rather just another Fazbear location, where he says that, quote, the company has deemed the suits temporarily unfit for employees and that the classic suits are being retired to an appropriate location while being looked at by our technician. Until replacement arrives, you will be expected to wear the temporary costumes provided to you. Keep in mind they were found on very short notice, so questions about appropriateness and relevance should be deflected. And while that could have been just some like crappy knockoff Frank Fazbear costumes from AliExpress or from like Spirit Halloween, the line of questions about relevance should be deflected seems to point that they aren't the normal Fazbear crew. And you know what? That would be the mediocre melodies. I mean, come on, his name is Ned Bear. Also, if you're enjoying this video, I want to see more FNAF because I, I know you all want to. You all love when we talk about FNAF and none of you think that we're doing it too much. Be sure you hit like and subscribe because come on, it's fun. You, I, I yell a lot. It's... It's my whole thing. Halfway through into number five, Matt Pat is canon! Kinda. Thanks to the Fazbear Frights book Bunny Call, and more so, like I said, the story in the flesh, Matt Pat is basically canon in the FNAF universe. Like, sure, it's kinda nuts that, in essence, Scott wrote an an mpreg fanfic about MatPat, but the crazier thing is that it, it makes MatPat canon in, in FNAF, technically, since his name isn't Matthew Patrick, um, and he's working on a new FNAF game, not a new FNAF theory, but he, he he's basically MatPat's in-universe standard, alright? Like, while game theory or doco may not be canon, the essence of MatPat is canon, and he ended up getting killed by a plush trap baby that crawled his way out of his stomach. Uh, yeah, I haven't finished that story, and I don't think I ever will, because I was cringing so hard, but I don't understand how working on a video game turns into an animatronic crawling out of your stomach, killing you instantly, but hey, it's FNAF, and we've had people be possessed by video games, so who knows at this point, anything is fair game, and you know what, if Choo Choo Charles shows up, that's just par for the course. And this is also yet another instance of someone escaping from a game and entering the real world, and that's, I don't want to deal with that. And there's also the one instance of someone saying, it's just a theory, and then the book pointing out that they say it like their favorite YouTuber. So so yeah, uh, map hat and game theory are canon in the FNAF world. Or maybe game theory is like a true crime theory podcast where the host at the end says it's just a theory to avoid any legal issues. Also, fun fact, I didn't know what mpreg fanfic meant until I had to look it up for this video. My sister told me I was ashamed. In it for Cover Shadow. A while ago, I purchased the Freddy Files updated edition book, okay, in an effort to get more details and really find what things seem to be the most important about the series. It's an excellent place to find confirmed details, but one thing I noticed a while after getting the book was that there's a shadow on the front cover. If you look closely, or if you just actually can see what's going on, unlike me, you can actually make out the shape of a Freddy standing behind you, which I have to say is, is pretty damn terrifying, because this implies that basically anyone who learns about the Fazbear secrets because of this book, which is prevented like secret files on the cover, will get got by Freddy. Um, yeah, this makes me think that there is certainly something more to this company. Definitely something more shady that we weren't considering or aren't considering or that just hadn't been presented yet. But it's still, it, it, it could not, it might not be that deep, but let's be honest, it's Scott, it probably is. Uh, so yeah, this one cover shadow shows us that Fazbear Entertainment is ready to silence anyone who learns too much for any reason. Which is why I'm still alive. <laughs> Getting close to the end of number three, Crash to Desktop. Golden Freddy is the most mysterious animatronic of FNAF 1, okay? Being able to move through closed doors while staying limp with no endoskeleton and can even cause hallucinations like it's me and Eyeless Bonnie along with changing posters on the frickin' walls. I originally figured that they could do all this because of other emotions, uh, but why would they crash us to the 
desktop when they jump scare us. It's a weird moment, especially the first time, but it's certainly going to crash you whenever you get killed by this freaky fiend. So it definitely means something. But this does have bigger implications than we originally thought, since now the series is about video games interacting with the real world apparently, and even FNAF World actually had those themes, setting up clock clues for the FNAF 3 good ending, but this is the first instance of FNAF interacting with kind of reality, and it's our reality, like not the in-game reality that we would assume. Maybe. Cause you know what, this also happens with Nightmare in FNAF 4. So my thinking was, is this symbolic of death? And you know what, since Golden Freddy is more than likely just a hallucination, uh, be sure you check out the video on that over there if you want more about it. Could this just be symbolic of like your brain or your heart giving out under an intense stress? I think so. That that's it. Yeah. But ultimately in number two, hanging scientists. The sister location hanging scientists weren't there before they're revealed to us. Because it's meant to show us that Ennard is able to kill and is willing to kill anyone to get his way. But that also means that there were other people working here while we were there during Sister Location. I don't know why there were, since it was literally filled with deadly animatronics and the only reason we were sent there was to put her back together like William had somehow asked us to do. But like, why were there other people there? Was the business still running? Is that what Chica's Party World was? Cause like, we know that they had been renting out animatronics, but why were there so many still there? Especially when they were only used for like a day. I mean, like we know why Baby wasn't rented out, but the others? I don't know, it's weird. But hey, I'm not here to judge how someone runs their business, but also that's exactly what I've been doing with every new FNAF list recently, okay? Just blasting William and Henry for their various OSHA and just human decency violations, so yeah. And finally, in at number one, Scrap Trap. What happened to Spring Trap between games to cause such discrepancies in his design? Sure, he was burnt in FNAF 3, but we then see him alive and well and then not damaged in Sister Location's Night 7 ending cutscene with burnt down Fazbear's Fright. So where did all this additional damage and warping and expanding come from? The head seems to be larger on Scrap Trap and so do his feet, so I genuinely don't know how this would make any sense, or at least I didn't. We know that they were the same person thanks to Ultimate Customized Voice Lines, but it, I was so confused as to what could have happened until it recently dawned on me. In my What If Golden Freddy Was a Hallucination video, like I've, I've already linked to it, I talked about how that would mean that FNAF 4 was a game made by Scott's in-universe version, since the nightmare aesthetic could be to to avoid copyright issues. And considering how everyone who should have known about the scrap animatronics should have died at the end of Pizzeria Simulator, but then the scrap animatronics show up in other games like Ultimate Custom Night and even FNAF VR, in a sense, it makes me think that these characters are less than real, and that the discrepancies between Spring Trap to Scrap Trap to Burn Trap are, are just because Scrap Trap is a fake animatronic, or well, it's a redesign of Springtrap to avoid copyright when Scott was working on his in-universe games, or at least when Scott's in-universe counterpart was making the games. And his deal with Fazbear Entertainment caused the nightmares to be able to be present in Help Wanted, which wouldn't really make sense if they were real nightmares of a deathbed crying child. Plus, I think that we can all get nightmares from FNAF now, and if you want to see why I do, be sure you click the video that's about to pop up on your screen. Thanks for watching. At 10, Ruin. We know that the main title of the DLC is going to be ruined. Now, whether this will be referencing my opinion of the series or the actual state of the Pizzaplex is unknown, but based on the poster, it's possibly both, because the Pizzaplex looks absolutely destroyed. The Freddy statue from the lobby is in pieces, and there is plenty of rubble all over the ground, and you can see the walls next to the escalators are actually pretty banged up. It's not clear if this is exactly how the lobby will look, since this is just an illustration, not a screenshot from the game, but it is still possible. They could design the damage around this poster, or they could have taken a screenshot and then had someone illustrate it instead, which is entirely possible. But given that this is going to be released in 2023, I doubt that they have stuff made properly for it. They may still be working out the storyline at this stage. In at 9, free. The name of the DLC may be ruined, but I'm damn glad it won't ruin my wallet. Especially when the main game was oddly enough in ruins and still cost me $50. And this was before I started buying cheap frozen meals to feed myself, so I was pretty broke. But honestly, I'm pretty glad that this DLC is free, especially with the amount of mods that are probably going to come from it. And it's also probably an attempted apology from Steel Wool since 
like I said, the original game was so busted and unfinished when it originally came out. Did you know that despite being incomplete, the original game uncompressed was 86 gigabytes? That's a bigger game size than Skyrim, for God's sakes. That's around the game size, or like a file size, or maybe even a little more than Grand Theft Auto V. That's absolutely insane. And now it's around 62 uncompressed, which is nicer, and it's 41 compressed. But still, goddamn, that's a lot for not that big of a game when you really think about it. In a date 2023, yes, as I said earlier, the DLC will not be releasing until 2023, which is unfortunate, but it could actually be a good thing. Firstly, it gives me at least another eight months of DLC themed content before it actually releases, if it is released in January and then the hype dies down for it, but it could also mean that the DLC will be even bigger and better than any previous one, like adding just a couple of more Nightmare animatronics or a couple of more levels. However, this also raises the question of is this the case or are they just taking their sweet time because all of this is a free DLC? Like, can we really expect to play something huge for free? I doubt it. Like, the only reason it might be free though is because it's affiliated with Scott. But after Scott stepping down, I don't really know how Steel Wool would handle this kind of thing if they were doing it on their own, so I can't really say for sure. And it's 7 Vanny Cam. We can also see 6 monitors on the poster which have multiple images of security cameras and Gregory on them. Across the 6 monitors, there are 4 total images that appear with the bottom two being the odd ones out, and the floor above that being two different images. One of Gregory looking surprised, and another of Vanny looking at the security camera that's glitching out. Very reminiscent of the iconic Bigfoot image that's very blurry, where he's walking like this. And I think that this is actually one of Scott's clever tricks. Like how he used the keypad in Sister Location to tell us that Crying Child and FNAF 4 take place in 1983, I think that Scott or Steel Wool is doing the same thing with this poster. By glitching Vanny out on screen, they're showing us that either A, Vanny was the entity that Gregory was talking to that was mentioned in the therapy tapes, or B, that Gregory having his vision glitch out when she is nearby is due to Gregory being a robot. It could be either, but it could also be both, considering how these are both next to pictures of Gregory looking surprised, and they're on both sides of the screen. Two pictures, two eyes. This is the real two eye theory. And it's six, brightness. As always, the first thing you do when you see any FNAF promo art or any image that's related to FNAF at all, you go and brighten it to find more details or maybe even some secrets. And the first thing that I noticed is that there aren't any question marks on this poster. Thank God. But there's also quite a few things that got revealed to me. Firstly, at the top there are actually two windows on the poster instead of the one that just seems to show up in the original. These windows also look like they are angry eyes, which could indicate an overarching villain. There are also a very faint set of eyes in the top right corner as well, aside not including the ones on the left that are clearly visible. But the ones on the right could just be an anomaly since they are very faint. And I also see that the girl in the middle doesn't have any color on her aside from her shoes. More on that later. And the floor also cuts off at the bottom, but the rocks on top of them don't. Mostly because at this point the ground has pretty much faded into black, but the rocks would still kind of be visible. But but seriously, th this girl is in black and white. Halfway through and at number 5, Collapse. One of the big questions we, or at the very least I had after Security Breach was what part of the Pizzaplex collapsed after the cave and during the true ending. And it was really up in the air whether it was the entire Pizzaplex or just Roxy's Raceway. I guess they kind of left it that way depending on what they wanted to do. But this poster and the title confirms that the pizza plex itself is in ruins. The whole place is a ruin. The giant Freddy statue from the lobby is destroyed and there's rubble everywhere. There are still some questions of course, like it is just an illustration after all. How's the rest of the pizza plex doing for instance? What happened to the other animatronics? What's the main goal of this DLC? But while the latter may have been answered thanks to another detail from the poster, I don't think we'll have any answers for a while. The DLC doesn't come out until next year, which is absolutely insane, but at least it's free. And it four eyes. And while Gregory's eyes may be robotic, there's another set that I would like to point out in this Security Breach Ruins poster. The red eyes in the top left corner of the screen. Now, this is very clearly Vanny, but since I've seen a few people get confused by this, let me explain why. The eyes are red, which we only really see Vanny have, since Burn Trap's eyes glow purple, and the animatronic eyes don't really glow. We also know that Vanny might have been able to survive the collapse due to her being controlled by Afton, but also because she was able to be on the roof before us when the fire starts in the rooftop ending. I mean, she gets pushed off the roof by Freddy, but we know that she was up there before us somehow, so I'm sure that she would have found a way around a collapse. Plus, 
plus if she's on the security cameras and the other showcased person is Gregory, who we know is alive, it just makes sense for Vanny to be alive. Plus again, red eyes. And they're in a similar position to where Vanny was placed in her first poster appearance as the shadow. You know, like the one where Freddy's rocking out and then there's like a bunny chick with a knife that we were like, who's that? Yeah, it's in roughly the same area. It's not in the same place exactly, but it's in the same vicinity. Getting close to the end of the number three, Busted Chica. Now, when I make jokes about rearranging Chica's guts, this is not what I meant. Yes, that's right. My main girl Chica also makes an appearance on this poster as probably the most resilient animatronic in the group because she's still kicking despite being crushed by a trash compactor and then a building and still having most of her smoke and hot bod. Some of it was removed and cracked, but her face also has seemingly melted due to possibly the fire we were using to kill Burn Trap, or maybe just because a fire started in the kitchen when the building collapsed. She's also lost the lower half of her left arm, her left, not your left, remember that, don't make my mistake, and she's also lost her right leg warmer. The casing for her midriff and her right arm is gone, but other than that, she's fairly intact, at least compared to Monty. Also, interestingly enough, only Chica's white face melted, meaning that it looks like someone, uh, um, spilt frosting all over her face. I guess that takes the term busted to a whole new level. But ultimately, in at number two, help me. Very reminiscent of the Save Them minigame from the earlier FNAF games. I'm pretty sure it's FNAF 2. You can see Gregory's face on the bottom left monitor with the phrase help me underscore written in green lettering. This seems to me to indicate that we may have a potential plot idea brewing where we need to save Gregory and Freddy after the collapse of the pizza plex, but we know that Gregory and Freddy sit on the hill in the final shot alone in the true ending, meaning that if we do end up having to save him, our player character will most likely die in the process. This also means that we will not be playing as Gregory, but more on that in a moment. The underscore here could also be another indication of Gregory being a robot, but it could also potentially just be a reference to a file within the main game or within the DLC that could contain some secret information. But I have no idea if that's true, that's just speculation for the time being. I'm gonna have to look in through the uh, actual security breach game files before the game comes out to see if there was an update that added one of those files. Since underscores are primarily used for putting spaces in file names without actually needing spaces. Or it just could be that we need help in this case. Finally, in at number one, Blondie. We do also see a new character on this poster, one we have never seen before. The little blonde girl holding the flashlight that is illuminating this entire scene. She's short, blonde, and wearing light up sketchers like the girl boss she is. But she is also presumably our player character given that she is front and center. Now as to whether we are looking for Gregory or if Gregory is looking for us is one thing, but I have a slightly wild idea that could help explain. The pigtails is very reminiscent of Baby, but this girl has blonde hair. And while we may not be able to see her face, I think that she may also have green eyes, because anyone with blonde hair makes me instantly think of Elizabeth Afton, who gets grabbed by Baby in 1983 and goes on to possess the animatronic. Now, given that we've made the comparisons of Gregory to Crying Child in the past, and the very familiar nature of this blonde girl, I think I have a reason why all these children have gone missing. Because they look like the original Afton children. Think about it. This girl looks a lot like the middle silhouette from the original Missing Children's article in the worst ending for Security Breach. And the rest of these children look similar to each other, at least using their silhouettes, because that's all we really have. Plus, Look at her light up sketchers, okay? Red and purple lights. I'm sorry, but when have we seen purple and it hasn't been an indication of Afton? Plus, the red is exactly like Vanny's eyes. This has to be one of the nine missing children, right? That got released thanks to the collapse of the Pizzaplex. Like, come on. That has to be it. That's all the time we have for today, friends. Be sure you let me know your thoughts and feelings about this down below, because I want to hear your security breach ruin theories, okay? I need them. And it's time Dark Carnival. And the recently released FNAF spin-off game, FNAF Security Breach Fury's Rage, which I just played on the channel. Click up in the top right corner to check that out. You fight as one of the four Security Breach animatronics against a slew of enemies. These enemies include the clown Springtrap skin from FNAF AR's Dark Carnival event. And not only do we see the character, we can actually see the carnival in the background when they get introduced. 
at least in the level they get introduced. Clown Springtrap gets introduced in the second level to the game I believe, and while scrolling through the streets, whenever the background isn't blocked by buildings in the middle, you can see the top of a tent, no doubt meant to be the carnival. Why there are so many Clown Springtraps, I don't know, why they're after us, I don't know, and why we never see Magician Mangle or Ringmaster Foxy is another mystery, but it's still a nice little detail nonetheless. In a 9, the house. The FNAF 4 house is one of the most iconic houses of all time. Okay, probably not true, but it's the most iconic house in FNAF at least. And we only get to see it in FNAF 4, at least that's what we thought, until the Curse of Dreadbear DLC for FNAF VR Help Wanted came out. In that DLC's main hub where we select the mini game we want to play, or in my case, have to play, we can see two hills in the distance. Whenever there isn't a giant Dreadbear looking over you, you can see a house on the hills. Very similar to how we see the house in FNAF 4 screens. Not only that, but if you turn the game to blacklight mode, Press the button on the monitor and then turn around to look at the car behind you for 10 to 15 seconds. You can see Glitch Tramp dancing on the hill next to the house. Well, on the other hill. And since people were confused about who Glitch Tramp was, this is probably Scott's way of showing that the FNAF 4 house is his and that Glitch Tramp is William Afton. But we all know that now 100% thanks to the Man in Room 1280 from the Fast Bear Frights book in the flesh. And in today, Eyeless Animatronics. FNAF 1 has the famous Eyeless Bonnie screen that can appear during hallucinations or when you die. However, I know some of you may not be aware that FNAF 2 actually has a similar screen, along with two others. Yes, FNAF 2 has three eyeless animatronic screens, all with a 1 in 1000 chance of appearing. These being eyeless Toy Bonnie, eyeless Freddy, and eyeless Foxy. It's interesting how Bonnie is the only animatronic to have two eyeless versions, and Chica doesn't have one at all. I don't know how this applies to the lore, if at all, or if they're just hallucinations that Scott added to make us look for more mysteries within the hallowed halls of Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, but it literally is, but it's the only animatronic that doesn't have an eyeless version. Like, it's Chica. That's kind of interesting. Maybe it's because she was the first and has seen everything. Haha, <laughs> so she has that eyes because she's seen everything. <laughs> and it's 7 Mask Switch. FNAF Sister Location is one of the more popular games in the series and has quite a lot going for it. Basically being a turning point in the series where the game started to revolve around the Afton family even more. However, at the top of the primary control panel through most of the game, you see what will become Ennard's mask. But every so often, for some reason it changes to Lulbit's head. I don't know why, but it can. And then it will switch back at some point. That's it, really. Don't know why it changes, since it can do so before Ennard is even created, but it happens and it's kind of hidden if you don't look up there too often. So, there you go. And at 6, Lulbit Butters. While the name of the number may entice anyone who is sad that the Brawler game was not called Furry's Rage, this is not about any interaction of who with Lulbit to make butter. Rather, in fact, in FNAF VR we can collect coins that we use to unlock various prizes at the prize counter. Upon collecting all of the coins, an exotic Butters basket will appear on the counter. On the bottom of the basket lies a button for some unknown reason. When pressed, however, you can see Lulbit's screen appear on the monitor up and to the left of the prize counter. It's unknown why this happens, but it's still pretty cool and something not everyone will know about unless they've watched someone play through the whole game and collected everything or have done so themselves. But I guess most of you will have either watched or done it yourselves. And there is at least one person who has clicked off this video at this point because it wasn't about Lulbit's butter. Halfway through it at number 5, Secret Poster. This is so secret even I don't know what it looks like, and I can't find any answers or images on Google. The FNAF VR DLC has a barn as its victory screen whenever you complete a game. When you win, you're brought to this barn, basically. However, there are three posters that can be one of three things. And in the distance, there is a fourth secret poster that never changes. But you can't really get a good look at it without boundary breaking. And since I can't do that, I'm forced to remain trying to squint and see what it looks like. I think it has to be some version of Chica for sure. Yo, what is, what is that poster? Is that Chica or something? I think that's Chica. This has been bugging me for so long that I actually might have to get the mod so I can move around just so I can know. It's not lore solving and it's not really that important, but it's a hidden detail that is still hidden to me. It bothers me to my core. And at 4, Radioactive. No, I'm not singing Imagine Dragons. I'm talking about another FNAF AR animatronic. This time talking about Radioactive Foxy from the Wasteland event, I believe it's called. This skin for Foxy makes him glow bright green and gives him a second hook on his right hand. As if he had two heads because ra radiation mutates things. 
Get it? Well, the character also has a radioactive symbol on him, and I don't care how crazy this world is, there is no way an animatronic got that symbol put on them with radiation. It's an animatronic, not an organic being. So even the two hooks would be impossible naturally, meaning that this character was created to be radioactive, and that's probably the scariest thing of all. At least Fazbear Entertainment is doing something normal companies do, like dumping toxic waste into animatronics or something like that. This seems more normal than sending out versions of your killer to homes with families inside. With all they've done, it's nice to see them do some actual normal company things. Gotta love capitalism. That's just proper grammar. Get it? Because capital letters? No, just me? Okay. And a three, copy. In FNAF VR Help Wanted, you can see multiple animatronics. However, the most interesting one is probably the coolest hidden secret animatronic, and it's Coffee, which isn't even an animatronic from the FNAF series. It's actually from another one of Scott's games which failed, like every other game before FNAF unfortunately, at least until FNAF was successful then the other games did well also. The game from which Coffee hails is called Desolate Hope, and in that game Coffee is an autonomous service robot designed to tend to the needs of nearby humans. It basically is a sentient coffee machine that actually makes coffee. Welcome to Yogg Labs. Coffee can be seen in FNAF 3 if you reload the level enough times and he will be sitting on your desk, unable to be interacted with, and he won't actually make you coffee. Which sucks because, you know, when I'm freaking out, when a 60 year old dude trapped in an animatronic is coming after me, coffee will really settle my nerves. But I'll definitely need it if I'm working from 12 to 6, that's for damn sure. Imagine FNAF, but like, real time. Dear God. And at 2, Game Link. This easter egg was pointed out by MatPat in one of his timeline videos for Ultimate Custom Night, where he started the video spending 10 minutes downloading a fresh copy of both FNAF World and Ultimate Custom Night so that nothing had been unlocked yet. In FNAF World, you are able to dive deep into the game code and visit Old Man Consequences, who will say some things and then ultimately make you drown yourself before you can get out. This reveals a secret ending to the game and gives you a trophy for it. In Ultimate Custom Night, you are also able to visit Old Man Consequences, who tells you to leave the demon to his demons and rest your own soul. However, if you do this, you'll need to drown yourself again to leave the game. Doing this, while never even playing a second of FNAF World though, will unlock the Old Man Consequences trophy. Which is odd, but might be Scott's way of saying that the game is still canon. I mean, it did talk about sentient code, and that things in game can infect the real world, since you lay out the clues for FNAF 3, probably hinting at the fact that the game may be key in solving what the lore is going forward, since we're seeing the same sorts of things emerge. Sentient code, games affecting the outside world, and potentially working its way into ours. Finally, in a number one, it's me. There are only two people who have been able to get this easter egg to my knowledge, and it involves getting the Curse of Dreadbear DLC and completing a game to be taken to the Victory Barn. There you will find three posters reminiscent of the ones from the Alleyway and Pizzeria Simulator. However, this is where the ability to unlock this easter egg is determined. You need to get three clown posters, which is incredibly rare, and I mean incredibly rare. Plus, you need to hit them all with darts, which you only get four of, and if you miss two of them, you're screwed. I've looked for this easter egg for hours on both my personal channel during live streams and on the live stream on this channel from before the previous lockdown, since I want to find this myself, and I want to so badly, since if you manage to do this, the barn changes to a seemingly black-like version, where the victory banner changes to read it's me, and everything starts glowing because of the black light. YouTubers Johnny Blocks and apparently Daco are the only two to have gotten this easter egg from what I've seen and what I've been told in the comments. Not even MadPat was able to get this, and Eddie VR wasn't really trying. I may have to keep live streaming the game until I find it, but it's going to take me a while I'm sure, and emotional torment. But this series already does that. In a 10, the real protagonist. Orville the Elephant in Ultimate Custom Night is one of the animatronics that's pretty memeable. Like, not as memeable as some of his counterparts, perhaps, but he does give us a lot of information if you are paying attention. Take this one line from Ultimate Custom Night, for example. He tried to release you, he tried to release us, but I won't let that happen. I will keep you here, I will hold you here, no matter how many times they burn us. But, like, wait, hold on a second. If this is really the voice of the one you should not have killed, whether you consider that Cassidy or Crying Child, then why would he say he tried to release you, he tried to release us? Henry was the one who tried to release William in FNAF 6, and if you want to assume that it's Cassidy, we know that the one Cassidy is referring to, since they said I won't let that happen, would have to be Henry, because he that's the one who released William. So, could it be that we've been playing as Henry this whole time with the exception of Sister Location and FNAF 4? I mean, like, we don't really release any souls in Sister Location, right? That would then mean that Henry was Mike Schmidt, and that the Mike who owned the logbook 
could be Henry, or I guess would be Henry, and then that we'd be reading it as Michael Afton? Man, that's a whole load of messed up. I don't want to deal with that. Speaking of messed up, only 19% of the people who watch these videos are actually subscribed, all right? You might not know that you're not subscribed. So do me a favor before we keep going, check the subscribe button, and if it's red, make it gray, all right? Gray is a much better color than red anyway, okay? Red is all anger. Make it gray, all right? You're welcome. And a nine intentional glitch. Glitchtrap is an odd character, an accidental addition to FNAF VR that somehow ends up interacting with the environment and altering aspects of the game. Why? I've always questioned why Glitchtrap is able to move around the curtain and even seemingly put us in a Freddy suit at the end of the game. Um, like, sure, he's, he's, a, he's a spirit, technically, I guess, maybe, actually not even at this point, since we've learned things later on, but he's still game coat either way, right? And like, he he would have to obey the laws of being game code. Like, any f being must obey the laws of the form they inhabit. How is he able to move things like the curtain when I can't, all right? I'm also code in this game. I can't move the curtain. It's simple, all right? He wasn't an accident. If he was a glitch, if he was unintentional, then he like, how would the ending even make sense? How would he put us in the Freddy suit, okay? We wouldn't crawl in there ourselves, right? We would just walk through the curtain and, like, nothing would happen because we wouldn't put ourselves in the suit. Like, come on, why was there another character there? No, did Glitchtrap replace them? I don't know. No, he, you know what? I do know. He didn't. He was, he was meant to be there, okay? Since you can see this ending without collecting all 16 tapes, which m would mean that Glitchtrap wasn't reassembled yet. There you go. Glitchtrap was an intentional feature in FNAF VR. In at 8, MatPat is canon. Kind of. Thanks to the Fazbear Frights book, Bunny Call, and more so the story of In the Flesh, MatPat is basically canon in the FNAF universe. Sure, it sounds kind of nuts that Scott wrote a mpreg fanfic about MatPat, but the crazier thing is that it makes MatPat canon in the FNAF world, in a way. Since his name isn't Matthew Patrick and he's working on a new FNAF game and not a new FNAF theory, but he's still MatPat's in-universe stand-in. While Daco or Markiplier may not be canon in the same way that MatPat is, it, it's still a thing. And you know what? MatPat ended up getting killed by a plush trap. Actually, a plush trap baby that crawled its way out of his stomach. I haven't finished the story, but uh, I had to I had to stop because I was cringing a lot, um, but I don't understand how he, he how he works on a video game and then it turns into him having an animatronic baby. I don't I don't get it. Okay, but hey, it's FNAF, and you know what? It's yet another instance of someone escaping from the game and entering the real world. However, this time it's it's. Spring Trap, which is a version of William Afton, so yeah, joy, great. Plus, there's the whole other mention of, like, the Game Theory sign-off in another Fazbear Fright story, which makes Game Theory canon as well, so no matter what way you slice it, it's a thing. And it's seven explosive ending. William dies in The Man in Room 1280, alright, the third story from the fifth Fazbear Frights book. Quite extravagantly, from what we're told, he explodes into a pile of mush right before a pastor's eyes. So, how is that possible? How could William just explode like that? It's not something that you really think about, but I, I have quite an explanation. William knew about possession and how it happened, alright? He knew about agony after his daughter got scooped and then his son got crunched. So, what if he tried to ensure his own survival by intentionally causing himself agony, injecting or installing some form of explosive inside of him that when triggered or when in the vicinity of a Fazbear warehouse or however he wants it to go off, would cause him to explode from the inside out, creating what is possibly one of the most agonizing ways to die even for the FNAF series. I mean like this guy was mental, even potentially injecting himself with remnant in an effort to stay alive. So for me, it isn't out of the question that William just kind of inserted an explosive inside of him just so he could uh, live on, in, in a sense, despite every bit of him being gone. <laughs> and it's six Arcade Conspiracy. The Arcade Conspiracy gets its name from one of the duffel bags that you can find in FNAF Security Breach, where we learn that something seems to be kind of off about this place. Yeah, I know, something's off about the Pizzaplex, how weird. Ah, quote from the Arcade Conspiracy note, Exit interview. They are working together, the arcades. They are hiding something. The glitches. Glitch them all at the same time. Then the princess will recognize me. She's testing me. I am not yet worthy. The others are protecting it. Let me stay. I'm so close. Just one more night, please. I can save the princess. 
Now it's clear that this seems to be referring to the Princess Quest games, however it, it also doesn't seem like we have to glitch the Princess Quest games in order to actually get that ending. We just have to beat them and find them in order from 1 to 3. And then boom, we save Vanny. So uh, what could this note really be referring to? Well, there are three arcade machines that seem to have mysterious glitches going on. The Balloon Boy World game that you can find in the theater in, like, Sun's little special hideout. Chica's Feeding Frenzy, which won't turn off even when unplugged, that you're supposed to be able to find in the bakery. And Monty's Golf A Arcade, that according to its duffel bag, shouldn't be in the mini golf area, but is. So, what's the deal here? Alright, what's going on with these games? We don't know because Chica's Bakery or Chica's Feeding Frenzy actually isn't implemented. We can't know. <laughs> we literally can't play it. Halfway through into number five, Dark Carnival. In the, I guess, uh, technically still recently released FNAF spin-off game Security Breach Fury's Rage, if you go by release order and not date at least, you fight as one of the four Security Breach animatronics against a slew of enemies. These enemies include the clown spring trap skin from FNAF AR's Dark Carnival event. And not only do we see the actual character, we see the carnival in the background when the character is introduced. Clown spring trap gets introduced in the second level to the game, and while scrolling through the street, whenever the background isn't blocked by Bill buildings or a fence or something, in the middle you can actually see the top of a tent, which is no doubt meant to be the carnival. Like I don't know, I don't know, okay, I don't know why there are so many clown spring traps there either, okay, I don't get it. Like I don't, why are they at, why are they after us? I also don't know. And why we never see Magician Mangle or Ringmaster Foxy is another question, but it's still a nice little detail nonetheless, alright? I played through the game on the channel a while back and I had a good time. I was finally able to wail on the animatronics that had caused me so much pain. So, it was definitely a freeing experience. In it for coffee. In FNAF VR Help Wanted, you can see multiple animatronics. Obviously, that's kind of the main point of the game. However, the most interesting one, at least in my opinion, is the secret animatronic of Coffee, which isn't even an animatronic from the FNAF series. It's actually from another one of Scott's games, which failed, like every other game before FNAF, unfortunately. But hey, at least FNAF was successful. It's Coffee, and the game from which Coffee hails is called Desolate Hope. And in that game, Coffee is an autonomous service robot designed to tend to the needs of nearby humans. It's basically just a sentient coffee machine that actually makes coffee. Welcome to Yog Labs. Coffee can be seen in Five Nights 3 if you reload the level enough times and it will just be sitting on your desk, unable to be interacted with, and won't actually make you coffee, which sucks. Because when I'm freaking out, uh, cause you know a 60 year old dude trapped in an animatronic is coming after me, coffee would actually probably help, but I'll definitely also need it if I'm working from 12 to 6 a.m., right? Like that's for damn sure. Imagine FNAF, but it's like real time and you had to do those six hours and you were only able to play it at midnight. Getting close to the end of number three, Hanging Scientists. The sister location Hanging Scientists weren't there before they were revealed to us. It's meant to show us that Ennard is able to and willing to kill anyone who gets in his way, but that also means that there were people working here while we were there during sister location, okay? I don't know why though, since it literally is filled with dead animatronics. And the only reason we were sent there was to put her back together, like William had somehow asked us to do. That's a whole other story. Like, why were the others there? Okay, the business wasn't running. The, the, like, is that what Chica's party world was? Like, were we renting out the animatronics? But like, if, if we were, why were there so many still in the building? Especially when they were only used for a day. I mean, like, we know that Baby wasn't rented out, and we know why, but like, the others? I don't know, it's just weird, but uh, hey, I'm not here to judge how someone runs their business. And ultimately, in number two, Blood on the Cover. The security logbook is a real point of contention for the series. Whatever, okay, I'm not talking about what's inside the book content-wise though. I'm talking about how there are literal pages covered or splattered with blood, and the restaurant just gave it to you as if nothing is wrong. What the hell happened to cause blood to get all over these pages? And then, thanks to like the finish on the book's cover, it's shiny, meaning that it's still wet. Which means that it's new, and I'm like, I'm prone to nosebleeds, alright? So like, I know that it's not a nosebleed. Y you don't lose that much blood, unless you're me, but that's, that, that's a whole other story, okay? Why is the book covered in blood? <laughs> it's, someone bled all over it, that's not even sanitary. Plus, you know, concerning, especially considering the reputation this place has. Someone explain it. And finally, in at number one, Scrap Trap. 
what the hell happened to Springtrap between these games to cause these warps, okay? Like, sure, he was burnt in FNAF 3, but we see him alive and not damaged in Sister Location's ending cutscene. So where did all this additional damage and warping come from, alright? The head is bigger, the feet are larger, I, I genuinely don't know how this is supposed to make sense. This is something that I've been mad about for a while, okay? I'm so confused as to what could have happened. I'm sure maybe there's extra damage coming from like wild animals maybe while well, he has to punch him out like some sort of God of War scene. It, I don't get it, okay? How did the suit head get bigger? It's not like he evolved. And it attends 1987 Easter egg. At the end of every FNAF game, there is a bonus night. It gives you a bit more lore clues and more scares, and that's what we consider the sixth night. But then after beating it, you unlock a special seventh night where you can customize the level of the animatronics and give them specific difficulty ratings to see how you can actually handle those certain scenarios. However, if you were to do this with Five Nights 1, you'd obviously be looking for more clues since we literally had nothing else. And and we were trying to figure out what would first be an incredible series of games. Uh, but if you tried to solve anything and you tried to be a little sneaky to figure out what that whole bite thing was about, and you put the animatronic levels to be 1987 in that order, like 1, 9, 8, and 7, the year of the bite, you'd end up getting instantly jump scared by Golden Freddy. Which is funny, but it could have had deeper implications. If you look at it through the lens of every detail means something, if you end up really thinking about it and probably too much, you can end up seeing this as an implication that maybe Golden Freddy caused the bite of 87, and that Jeremy Fitzgerald, who we would play as in FNAF 2, who many assume to be the bite victim, could be the one possessing the animatronic. At least if we ignore that the whole missing children's incident thing takes place two years prior. But then again, that's just something else that we would have to ignore, so it still works. In at nine, same path. Now, part of the strategy behind the FNAF games is that the animatronics will always follow the same route every time, or I guess, Rather, they'll come towards you the same way every time. In FNAF 1 specifically, Bonnie always comes down the left hall, while Chica and Freddy always go down the right side. And the same remains true for the rest of the games, which technically, if you think about it, means that these characters are coded this way. If they were just free roaming, that would be one thing, but the fact that they come after you and do so the same way each time would suggest that this is actually intentional. I mean, yeah, sure, twice is a coincidence, but don't they say that three is a pattern? Well, it's the same thing here, okay? In multiple games, the animatronics come down the same path every time. FNAF 1, FNAF 2, FNAF 4, Ultimate Custom Night. And not even just that, but the fact that the animatronics do this multiple times within the same game. Hell, how many times does Bonnie come at you down the left hall in one night, let alone throughout the whole week that you play? So yeah, we would have to logically ignore this detail because it would muddy everything else up way too much. And we have been actually. In it a death coin. In Ultimate Custom Night, you are able to get an item called a death coin. This allows you to use it and eliminate any animatronic from the game. This works with most animatronics. It removes them from play, and then you won't have to deal with them for the rest of that playthrough, or I guess technically life. I'm not really sure how you how Ultimate Custom Night defines things. But, there is at least to my knowledge one animatronic that this coin does not work on, that being Golden Freddy. If you try it on Golden Freddy, and you use the death coin on him, you end up getting jump scared by the Fredbear plush, who some believe is meant to be psychic friend Fredbear. And while it would make sense that you can't remove Golden Freddy because seemingly they'd be the one controlling everything, or the animatronic that gives you the most grief depending on the situation you believe is taking place, the fact that Fredbear is the one that uh, jump scares you, the, the actual like plush, has to kind of be taken with a grain of salt. Because honestly, it may not have that deep of an impact. And if it did, we have really no idea what the hell that would be. Especially when Ultimate Custom Night seemingly tried to wrap up the Afton family storyline. And it's Seven Joy of Creation. There are actually some references to some of the Fazbear fan vs. initiative games in Security Breach. For example, the Joy of Creation Easter egg of Ignited Freddy and Ignited Bonnie, found on the House of Bear and House of Bear 2 arcade cabinets found around the Pizza Plex. This is something that I actually picked up on my my first time through, so needless to say, it was pretty cool that I was right about that. I was like, hey, isn't that Ignited Freddy? And it was. And the House of Bear cabinet has like the Ignited Freddy shadow standing in the doorway, and then the House of Bear 2 machine features Ignited Bonnie's face, which could be considered Withered Bonnie, but given the context of the Ignited Freddy in the first one, I'm gonna have to say it's Ignited Bonnie. But if you really want to think about this, this could explain how like the Fazbear games fit into the timeline, since the fanverse could be the games that Scott's in Universe counterpart made. Which 
which would explain why they would have their own FNAF 1 titled FNAF Plus, but honestly, we're probably meant to ignore this idea. Because let's be honest, if that was the FNAF 1 of this universe, the company wouldn't have arcade cabinets featuring the characters. So, this is probably just meant to be like a happy little reference for fans of that series and, and nothing more. Uh, plus, it's, it's Steel Wool who was doing that and not Scott. And at 6, crashing. Golden Freddy has some weird abilities, okay? Like, what's with the whole crashing us to the desktop thing? Every other animatronic sends us to the main menu, but Golden Freddy, for some reason, sends us to our desktop. It's a very odd detail that I don't think anyone was really questioning but it certainly seems to indicate that there could be something special about the character. Well, I mean, something more. And I don't think that it's simply maybe they're just angrier than everyone else and something like that. It would have to be more symbolic, because the only character that, when killing us, crashes us to our desktop is Nightmare from FNAF 4. They're the only two animatronics to crash us to the desktop instead of to the main menu, and while with Golden Freddy it may not make much sense, with Nightmare having the same ability, it may set a baseline for what's really actually happening when this happens. Nightmare in FNAF 4 is representative of death. When Nightmare gets us, we crash to the desktop in that game and truly die, which would mean that the same would have to be true for Golden Freddy, right? But then, that would make a whole load of other things messy if you want to assume that Golden Freddy is a real animatronic and possessed by Cassidy, who also is possessing William. So, you would have to ignore that detail if you're going down that route. Halfway through into number 5, Ultimate Custom Knight Roster. If you want to go down the path of Cassidy being the one you should not have killed, that's fine with me, as long as you don't use that path of thinking to insult anyone who thinks otherwise. Since, after all, nothing is truly proven with this series literally ever. But, if you do believe that, for some reason, Cass Cassidy is possessing William to keep him alive to continue suffering, you kind of have to ignore the animatronics present in Ultimate Custom Night. Because there is no possible way that Cassidy could know about the nightmare animatronics. It just, it doesn't make sense if she did. Crying Child is the one who's seeing these nightmares in his coma while in the hospital in FNAF 4, as evidenced by the flatline that we hear at the end of the game. And since he dies before waking up, he wouldn't be able to share this information with anyone. You can say that he let Cassidy know about them while they were sharing Golden Freddy or something, but that's you ignoring other details in the series. And if Cassidy wasn't Golden Freddy, how could she also be possessing William? You'd again be ignoring every other detail that we've learned about possession. And why are the animatronics calling the one you should not have killed him if it is Cassidy? Cassidy is a female in this universe, as evidenced by her counterpart in the novel trilogy and the only other human in the logbook. And if you want to say that they're saying him because of Golden Freddy, again, how could she be possessing both? And why would she make these animatronics that she is creating call her him. If she's mad about being killed, why would she be referring to herself by her animatronic? Okay, it doesn't make sense. Unless Cassidy is possessing William as the vengeful spirit, and the one you should not have killed is Crying Child, who Cassidy is using to torment William. But even still, for this to work, you'd have to ignore the nightmares being present in that game. And in four nightmares in VR. On that same line of thinking, how are the nightmare animatronics present in FNAF VR? If we are to assume that FNAF 4 is an actual canon plot point in the series, then these animatronics being present would be impossible. The only way that this could make sense would be if FNAF 4 specifically was one of the games that Scott's in-universe counterpart made. That's the only way that Fazbear Entertainment would know what these animatronics look like. And it would explain why they would be present in the game that they're using to say like, yeah, this happened, but we're better now. Since they're trying to rebuild their reputation as we learn in this game. But, that also calls into question every other game that we've played. Because FNAF 1, 2, 3, parts of 4, and even sister location animatronics are in FNAF VR. Which would mean that if they remade FNAF 4, because it was an in-universe game, every other FNAF game before this, or even before FNAF 6, would be just that. Again, Game. Getting close to the end in number three, Fire Dave. Found in one of the various lore duffel bags that we can stumble upon in Security Breach, it's a customer complaint titled Hi Dave, which upon inspection reads, quote, customer complaint, you should fire Dave, he sucks. And while it is short and sweet and to the point, it's also seemingly a reference to the FNAF novels, since if you're unaware, in the novels William Afton was introduced, but at first he was going by the alias of Dave Miller. And considering how this customer says that you should fire Dave, I think that's a pretty telling way to reference the book's most infamous employee. And it's also a reference to the fact that Afton is in the pizza flex right below our noses, or I guess technically our feet. Though we would have to ignore this detail because it's not really going to have much more of an impact than that, just being a reference. It's 
it's it's just gonna be a guy named Dave, okay? No connection to anyone else. Especially since, again, this game was from Steel Wool and not just Scott Coffin, which is where most people tend to use the whole idea of if Scott put it in the game, it has to mean something. But if you wanna if you wanna say that and you don't wanna listen to literally anything else I've said on this list, this was made by Steel Wool, so can't really use that here. But ultimately, in at number two, Jeremy. If you spend too much time looking into names, then you're really going to be in for a crapshoot when it comes to FNAF. Considering how Scott has used the first name Jeremy way too many times for a fan base as detail attentive as this one. Because the name Jeremy has been used for the first night guard from FNAF 2, the victim who possesses Bonnie, and the first Freddy Fazbear virtual experience game tester who ends up cutting his face off cause Glitchtrap got to him. If you really want to think that Scott puts every single detail in this and like it's meant for those details to all mean something special, how do you explain this. Okay, most of the time people just write this off as a troll, which means that if this is a troll, other things could be trolls too, right? You can't just say that everything means something aside from the Jeremy thing. That just doesn't make any form of logical sense. And you know what? It doesn't even make a form of unlogical sense. Since if anything, the name being used three times would be more important than like passing comments made in one game, right? Exactly. But it doesn't mean anything, okay? Bonnie isn't getting resurrected multiple times, Jeremy isn't Satan or something like that. It's just a name. It's not that deep. Finally, in at number one, Immortal and the Restless. This detail is the reason I made this entire list. This is one comment that I've been seeing time and time again. The Immortal and the Restless was a show to show us that Afton didn't want his kid or kids, so this theory makes no sense. These details and all the others are put in there for a reason. But like, we just went over nine details that we have to ignore either in general for things to make sense or for your certain line of thinking to make sense. Or that we've just been ignoring the whole time, meaning that we can't take every single pixel of a scene into account when trying to find the big picture. The Immortal and the Restless has never popped up again after Sister Location. There has never been another instance of that show having any significance other than just being something we watched after work in that game. It didn't reveal the mother's name, it didn't reveal that Afton never wanted his son because if if he never wanted crying child, why would he have sworn to put him back together? Or revealed to Michael that Elizabeth was possessed, or literally anything else that we've seen happen in this series. It just doesn't make sense. The Immortal and the Restless shows up less often than the name Jeremy. And honestly, it has just as little significance as the name. It was a soap opera, okay? What I watch on TV doesn't mirror my life or my family's situation, unless it's Dr. Phil, and why would it mean that William didn't want a crying child? Why couldn't it be that William thought his wife was having an affair? Maybe if this does have significance, it's meant to show that William snapped and killed his wife when crying child was born because he didn't think that it was his son. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for coming to my Fred talk. Schooled.